World Affairs Roundup, next on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs at UWM and Milwaukee Public Television present International Focus, a global magazine linking Wisconsin and the world. Welcome to International Focus and another edition of our World Affairs Roundup. I'm Robert Sigliano, Director of the Institute of World Affairs at UWM. Today we'll be looking at the long count. Voters in Zimbabwe feared foul play as the government delayed announcing official results of the presidential election there. Meanwhile, the opposition candidate declared victory, claiming the 28-year rule of Robert Mugabe had come to an end. Is Zimbabwe headed for a troubled transition? What's the hurry, Nuri? Iraqi Prime Minister Nuri al-Maliki caught U.S. officials off guard with a hastily executed crackdown on Shia militias that the Bush administration quickly dubbed a defining moment in Iraq. With the government unable to gain a decisive victory, has strategic balance in Iraq shifted? A no from NATO. Despite aggressive Bush administration lobbying, NATO allies meeting in Bucharest declined to place Ukraine and Georgia on an immediate path to membership. American plans for missile defense and Afghanistan received more favorable responses. What are the new, dynam what are the new dynamics driving the alliance? PR, PR and the PRC. Protests accompany the Olympic torch lighting ceremony in Greece, forcing China to manage fallout of its Tibet crackdown. This week's arrest of a prominent activist, policy in Darfur, and a generally questionable human rights record also threatened to rain on the Olympic parade. As Beijing worries over its image as a benevolent host, governments ponder their responses. Are some guests planning to spoil the Olympic party? To help us explore these issues, we're joined by John Katzka, a retired U.S. Foreign Service officer who has conducted public diplomacy for the Department of State on four continents. Anne Hamilton, political scientist and coordinator of international studies at UW-Whitewater, who also served in the U.S. Foreign Service. And Robert Craig, author of a number of articles and books dealing with the history and politics of American foreign policy. He currently serves as program director for Citizen Action of Wisconsin. Well, welcome back to World Affairs Roundup, everybody. Um, well, we've got a lot to cover, and, and I, I thought, Anne, we would, I would start with you in, in reference to Zimbabwe. And before we get to the question of will Robert Mugabe survive, I suppose the question I want to put is how has he survived this long with a 100,000% inflation and 80% unemployment? What's, what, how have we got to this position? Well, Robert Mugabe first um, founded his liberation movement in 1963. Um, this was around the time that Ian Smith um, illegally declared independence in southern Rhodesia, which the British objected to uh, greatly. Um, but the British felt they couldn't do anything because they, for, for example, apartheid South Africa was just over the border and they didn't really feel that they would be able to do this militarily. And over the years, Robert Mugabe was one of several national liberation movement leaders who gained a lot of uh, following. Um, and when he finally became the leader at independence, he had this tremendous prestige amongst the population as the liberation hero um, for standing up to Ian Smith and for standing up to the British. Um, there are a lot of things that have gone wrong in his 28 years in power. Um, and he's managed to stay in power in part through outright uh, corruption, um, taking over farms, doing all sorts of um, things that really have led to the destruction of the country, like pushing all the white farmers off of their, their farms, for examples, and um, destroying shanty towns, um, uh, rigging elections, the whole thing. But it's taken time for him to really lose all of his legitimacy because it was really very strong. Mm -hmm. um, and he continued to, you know, it was the Commonwealth then that was um, going against him, but still he could sit back and be the anti-British, you know, put on that mantle again. Um, so I think that he really did play that card very, very well, and it's come to an end. I mean, the country definitely wants change, and he's 84 years old. Well, um, so, Robert, I suppose that then, the, I, in light of the history that Anne's talked about, I, I suppose I could flip that around and say, well, if, if he is that strong of a, of a, of a, of a, not a, not necessarily a dictator, but a, a, uh, strong man who's been democratically elected. How has it gotten to this far, where he's actually facing the potential of a, of a runoff or a defeat, in the presidential election? Well, he's off, off, obviously off his game a bit, <laughs> and 
you know, there, there's a hope maybe since he seems to have allowed an election to take place, which he certainly lost in Parliament and probably lost it at the presidential level as well, that perhaps he was ready to go. But now with the uh, refusal to release election results, it appears he's not ready to go. It's looking today uh, like he'll force a, re a, a runoff election, in which case he may well try to steal it back, which will plunge the country into even deeper crisis. And we're talking about a country with uh, a thousand percent inflation, or is it higher than that? Right, well, it was a hundred thousand. Yeah, right, it's, only, it's, yeah. it's hard to imagine the math involved yeah. in this on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I don't, don't want to understate it. Eighty <laughs> percent unemployment, uh, et cetera. So things could get a lot worse unless he's willing to step aside now that he has apparently lost an election. So, so John, what, what I guess uh, from two sides, if, if you're if you're looking at this from the U.S. government position, is this something the U.S. gets involved in, or or not? We get involved in it over human rights issues and over some of the basic principles that, that we support internationally. Uh, we had a strong interest in Southern Africa, but that was before South Africa became independent or the, there was the change in government in South Africa before Angola was released and before Namibia became an independent state. Uh, our interest in Zimbabwe is far less than, say, the Brits's. Me, I, was, I served in Zambia, just north of Zimbabwe, in the early 80s. And I traveled through Harare and through Zimbabwe a number of times. And, and in, in a modest defense of, of uh, Mugabe, the agricultural situation there has been, has been very, very bad for a long time. They've had drought for many, many years. And all the farmers, including the white farmers, were affected by this. And so this has fed it, has eaten into the ability of him to be able to provide. In addition, he comes out of the school of the Maoist-oriented leaders of Africa, like Nyerere. And he was, he's particularly doctrinaire about this and very, very unwilling to make any concessions. So uh, he also comes out of the Shona tribe, which represents 82% of the population. Uh, the other tribe, which, which was the opposition in uh, the early days of uh, post-independence, uh, only made up 12 percent. So, so and um, does does Mugabe hang on? I mean, it, and 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 uh, it, will will this will, if he does? Let's put it that way. If he does decide to hang on, and if the election does say appear to be stolen back. Um, can this situation continue, or, or, or will, will, is this an African issue, a Southern African issue? Is it, is it a U.S. or a world community issue? I think the, the Brits are definitely making it their issue. It's been their front-line story since um, before the elections, front-page story. They're putting a lot of pressure. Um, I guess they've been watching it by the hour, how this is evolving. Um, they are standing ready, uh, along with some other countries, to put in a lot of aid um, should uh, Mugabe agree to step down. If he doesn't, I think the prognosis is is quite bad. I think there will be a lot of international pressure. I think there may well be violence within the country. Um, it could spin out of control and, and perhaps lead to um, something like um, some kind of mediation as we saw in Kenya. We don't know. It's important to know that the opposition to, to Mugabe now comes from his own party. Morgan Svengari is, is from out of his own party. Other parts of this also, and they're all Shona. These are, this is, so there isn't a tribal issue here, and there really isn't an ideological. There is a big separation. And the real telling thing that I found in, in recent reading about this is that he had the countryside up to this point, and he's losing that. And the economic conditions are driving. I think that's why he's caught in this position. He has probably applied the same amounts of pressure to the process, but that the opposition to what he's doing or what's happening is rising so much. But he's got the opportunity now to step in and to do something about it. Well, I want to I I move us into a, another uh, uh, rough democratic transition process, which is, which is in Iraq. And, and Robert, I'll start with you on this one. We, we hear a lot about the, 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 this recent crackdown in Basra and in Baghdad and the confrontation between the government and, and uh, Muqtad al-Sadr and the, and the Mahdi army. Um, we've, we have a new national intelligence estimate out saying that things are, surges basically working, but there are still lots of in, instability and, and insecurity. Um, what, what do you see in, these, in this current situation? What does it tell us about what's really happening 
in Iraq? Well, I mean, the Bush administration said this is a defining moment. I think it, w it is a defining moment, but for reasons different than they're suggesting. Uh, we've invested a great deal in building the civil society. That's what all the post-invasion investment of billions, billions of billions of dollars has been about. And here we, and so the question is, do we have a unifying government here that can build a stable civil society that we can then, you know, we, we can withdraw from the country and others can and it can function? And you have al-Maliki functioning as a factional leader here, essentially taking this supposedly independent unifying army we've invested trillions of dollars into and then using it against another leader, uh, Sadr and, uh, and in his army, and then fighting him, I mean, approximately to a draw in Basra, which is not promising at all. So it suggests that there are huge factional divisions remaining, that we've not built any unifying civil society, and that really, I mean, we're going to eventually going to have to leave the country, but that we haven't built a stable situation or, at all with our investment. So it, it really shows how little progress has been made, I, I'm afraid. John, so is, is, is this a sobering moment? I mean, is, was this a, a test of the government that, that did, just didn't go well? I, I think it was a test of the government. Uh, I, I also think that uh, at the risk of uh, possibly disagreeing with Robert on this, this I think perfectly allowable. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think he's taking much too short a view of this process. One does not create a civil society in five years. Uh, these are decades long processes. And uh, I'm not suggesting that we have to be part of that, but that's what the process is. Uh, I think you can look at, a, at the, the silver lining on this process. He did do something. Uh, I'll remind that when, during our Revolutionary War, we had desertions as well amongst troops. So this is not unusual in armies without a broad tradition of working together and working towards a purpose. So I'm not, I'm not enormously upset by that, and I don't think that the administration should be too worried about the, the kinds of uh, pot shots that are being taken from the, from the, op, from the opposition. Well, as, as you were mentioning, John, there, there were a report of up to a thousand uh, uh, police and, and army that, that either abandoned their posts or refused to, to fight. Um, is this so? If we come back to this idea of, of it as being a defining moment, what what what's the definition we're we're getting out of this? <laughs> um, I don't think the, the reports that I've read don't say that it really came to a draw. I mean that it's it, the indications are that the that um, the Mehdi army has has won. I mean really and humiliated the Iraqi mm -hmm. forces, which. Um, and that the Iranians are the w are, were very um, important in brokering a truce between various Shia groups, excluding uh, the government. So it's hard to say what the long-term significance is, but certainly this looks like um, not only a military but uh, a political, actually a, a political defeat for, it weakens al-Maliki, definitely. Um, for uh, the short term, strengthens uh, al Sadr and, and, and Sa Sadr was the, his block were the defining votes that put Maliki over the top within his own party for the prime ministership. Right, and and they're and they're coming up to elections now. But they've too. been disagreeing for over a year right. over the how long the U.S. is supposed to stay. Al Maliki wants a timetable, and I mean uh, al Sadr wants a timetable, and al Maliki is is not prepared to do that at this time. Mm -hmm. So I suppose this is, this is the defining moment we need to keep our eyes on as we, as we go forward. Well, here, watch, Iran. Well. watch Iran. Watch Iran. Iran. And Iran. And, and looking at Iran's uh, ability to influence right. events in, in Iraq as well. Right. Um, right. Well, we have our break, so we'll, we'll be back in, in just a moment. We'll be back in just a moment here on International Focus to pick up our next two stories. We'll see you in just a moment on International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus on our World Affairs Roundup. We're talking with John Kotzka, Ann Hamilton, and Robert Craig about the news events of, of the last few weeks. So, John, I want to start with you on this story about what's happening in NATO. And so we had a kind of a mixed decision uh, where, where it came to uh, s some receptiveness to missile defense and a greater NATO presence in Afghanistan, but a, but a no 
to bringing in Ukraine and Georgia. Right. Uh, I, I'm wondering what you read into how those decisions were made and, and the considerations. Is Russia now really a, a main player in in NATO? How, what does this mean for the, the, the alliance? Maybe it's a mix, mixed metaphor as well as a mixed message. Uh, I, I, first of all, let me say that it, uh, it's a bright and shining day for Bucharest. Uh, the, I was there uh, up to 97, and uh, at, when, we, when I left there, it was unlikely that they were ever going to become part of NATO and considered a, mem and, and a member of the EU. So these are, are very wonderful days for, for the good people of Bucharest. Uh, looking at this issue from the various points of view, the U.S., they got the missile defense shield that they were looking for. It, and apparently they are identifying sites with the Czech Republic and they're, they're still negotiating with the Poles. Uh, the second thing is they did not get uh, the Ukraine and Georgia as upcoming members. What's the significance of that, John, of, of, of not getting those two? Well, if you come around to it from the other points of view, uh, I, I'll, let me come to that okay. in that way. Uh, the Europeans have developed an interest in this missile this missile defense shield simply because of a resurge in Russia. Uh, there are things that can help them as they, re lo as they look further down the road. Uh, there's also clearly a, a divide between old and new Europe on this as they look at security. With the, new, with the new Europe, the Poles, the Czechs, the Romanians, more in touch with our definitions and concerns about where things are going in Russia, where old Europe the Germans and the French especially are very concerned about the energy access points that come from Russia. What did Russia do? They stopped us from getting Ukraine and, and, and Georgia as part of, but, but they also are getting this missile defense issue. Uh, there's going to be ramifications of that too, and, and the Europeans are concerned about that. The new members, uh, Albania and Croatia were invited and a very interesting thing, Macedonia is invited as, as soon as they work out their issues with the Greeks over the name Macedonia. You have to be, you have to be <laughs> well, there to show, understand. Right? <laughs> you have to be there. We can go on for years on that one. Uh, the, the, uh, and they also began negotiations with the Montenegrins and the Bosnians and left the door open for opening those negotiations when they're invited by the Serbs to begin talks. Interesting. So those are the different points of view. But there. then it seems, so it seems like the only ones who are not in, at least likely to be invited to the party are Ukraine and, and Georgia, and is the sole reason for that then Russia? And, and, and if so, um, what, is, what, is it, what is it about the relationship between the United States, Russia, the Europeans and Russia, NATO and Russia that's, that's driving this? Well, if you think of it from a Russian perspective, um, I can understand their concern about Ukraine um, and Georgia becoming members of NATO, which um, was defined as a military alliance and hasn't quite defined, in the post-Cold War period, hasn't really defined what it's supposed to be. Kind of the um, Monroe Doctrine. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I can, I can mm. understand their, their concern about it. And they did, interestingly, um, they did say, someday you will become a member. Um, which made, you know, the Ukrainians touted that as a, you know, as a victory. I mean, all of those sort of a hollow victory, it means, doesn't mean in the next five years you will, but they didn't say, no, you know, maybe we'll consider you in the future. They actually made that positive statement. So they could present this as, as some kind of a victory, which is, you know, the Russians are not going to be happy even with that uh, statement. That's like um, rubbing salt into the wound. Um, so I fully, I, I can see why the Russians are, are um, upset about this, and I actually think that it was a good solution. I mean, I, 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 my understanding is that um, Angela Merkel was very upset with George W. Bush at the, at the dinner the night before and concerned about how strident he was and how he was, mm -hmm. wanted to ram this down the, the other members' throats. Um, so I think we actually got off extremely well. I mean, we, we gained a lot from this summit, uh, given, um, even though we went in with that goal, we, we did get quite a lot, and we didn't completely lose there. Well, I, I guess, wanna, I wanna, Robert, I want to ask you to focus a little bit on, on another part, piece of this picture, mm -hmm. which is Afghanistan, where the, the right. a lot of the news in the last several months had been uh, strengthening the NATO commitment 
to, st to Afghanistan, you had the, the Canadians saying unless the, the other countries in NATO decided to do it, they were going to pull their troops out of the south of Afghan Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which is a really significant uh, commitment on their part. Um, so so how, how did that issue fare, and what does that tell us about, about where the alliance is? Well, it's interesting. Not only the French agree to give a 1,000 troops to Afghanistan, which is the one ongoing conflict NATO has right now as far as an ongoing military project, the military alliance, supposedly. Um, but in addition, the French have agreed to uh, reverse de Gaulle's uh, position from 1966 and reintegrate their forces with NATO. So old Europe is coming back together <laughs> in NATO, uh, John, at the same time <laughs> that there's this division between old Europe and new Europe. So, but there's certainly, you, it's hard to say that there's strong NATO unity around Afghanistan. It's a, it's a place where a few of the partners are working on Afghanistan. There's a disagreement about what the goal is. For the United States, it's going in the war on terror and taking out uh, the Taliban. Uh, a lot of the Europeans see it as more of a peace-keeping uh, kind of mission and a humanitarian mission than they do a military mission. So there's a lot of divisions within NATO, and, there, and it's not even clear with, other than the symbolic value for Ukraine and Georgia of joining NATO, what it actually means as far as a unified foreign policy or global sure. position. Well, also, we agree to send more troops in as well. Mm -hmm. and, and also, as, as Robert described those various missions, there is room for all of them. There is, the, there is the fighting component, there is the peacekeeping component, and there's the nation-building component. And NATO countries can pick out which ones they want to address. Now, I would say that, I mean, the missile defense part is a bizarre, like, late Cold War throwback. It doesn't work. And you wonder if the Bush administration wanted to get Ukraine and Georgia in, then they might have not wanted to push so hard for the missile defense, which also offends Russia. It's like you couldn't do all of those things at once. But, uh, well, speaking of offense, uh, there are some who are taking offense <laughs> on both sides of, of, of the issue of, of the Beijing Olympics. And, 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 and I wonder if you could, from a political scientist perspective, if you look at the, the maturity of, of China, and, and these Olympics were supposed to be the big coming out party for, for China. And it's, it's looking like what's coming out is not necessarily going to be to China's liking. So how do you read the, the Olympics in that vein? Is, is, how is this exposing China to the world, or is it giving China a new face? Well, they definitely care very much about putting on um, a very good show. I mean, they have seen this as their, as you said, reintegration into the world. It's their, it will be their showcase. Um, they are, have spent lots of money and they've done everything early to ensure the only thing that they're not sure they can control is the air. Um, but they're <laughs> doing their best. The air quality, I mean, there, there will be the air, air there. quality, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, although I have a, a friend who said the communists can control everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, they're in a difficult position because, and so is the rest of the world actually, because w people care very much about human rights in China. Um, various governments are trying to decide what to do given the unrest that's happened in uh, Tibet, um, given the situation in Darfur, um, but also understanding that we need to work with China um, I don't think that anybody really, wa I mean, except perhaps for the NGOs who are, you know, solely concerned with human rights interests, that we don't really want to see China fall on its face um, by having everybody boycott the opening ceremonies. Um, so people have to think about this carefully. What are their interests? Um, and so does China as yeah. it goes along the way. You know, what's going to trigger these responses from governments? Do you, or do you think do you think uh, governments are gonna are gonna go to the mat on this one? Are they are they really gonna push their relationship with China, risk possible embarrassment of China over human I, rights and? I think there's a great deal of ambivalence there. I mean, China's opened itself up to this by wanting to have this coming out party. It's exposed itself to those who want to get in the way and again show what. Uh, the policy is in Tibet, what the policy is in Africa, for example, and but they have, but a lot of the other major countries in the world have a huge economic interest in trade with China, and so they feel constrained. China wants to use that in order to force everyone to st st toe the line and say and say that they're that that they're going to support China's coming out party. It's hard to know. There's going to be a lot of cross pressure on this and a lot of pressure from NGOs, yeah. and it puts a lot of countries in a very difficult situation. Well, we, we, we're running down to, to less than a couple minutes, and I want to give you time. And so, John, I'll give you the, the, the chance either to pick up the China discussion or spot for us an issue that you want us to watch in the weeks Well, ahead. I'm going to come back to an issue I raised before, and that's the changing nature of Europe outside of NATO. And, that's, and it's led, led principally by Sarkozy. And not only is he changing the Gaulist past and looking at more in terms of redefining France within Europe, 
but he also is looking towards the the uh, to the Congress of uh, of Nations idea that uh, uh, and he's courting the British right now as a possible uh, counterweight to the Germans and the and their larger economy in Europe. Yeah. Also on Europe, uh, Scotland has um, yeah. last week set up a new. Commission with the with the UK with the with, with Westminster to actually reconsider the whole relationship between Scotland and England, mm. and the only thing that people agree on is that it's not going to continue to be the way it is now. So some are saying that we may get that they may actually get much closer to independence. Well, that's the Kashmir contra controversy. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, I'll go domestic. That is Tax Day, April fifteenth, will be the next opportunity for people for opposition to the war to talk about the cost of the Iraq War. I know John talked about taking decades, at least rebuilding civil government, which doesn't go as far as McCain's 100 years, but we're <laughs> inching that direction. Well, uh, uh, Robert Craig, Ann Hamilton, John Kaska, thank you again for a, for a great World okay. Affairs Roundup. To our viewers, we'll see you next week on International Focus. Thank you.